better get your logbook and your crystals out because we're talking about the novice station from 1960 to the early 70s. Whole bunch to cover in this video. This is going to be a good one. Well, I'm looking at this log and it says I've got $501 in my checking account. I must have been rich back then. Got some good contacts in here too. Here's a YN8ARC. Holy cow, I must have been flying on 15 meters with my novice station. Anyway, this is kind of a personal story, but I drag in some of my friends too because we all became novices at the same time in the early 70s. But uh, this is too much to look at. We're going to go through it a little at a time, talk about uh, some of the early novice stations what a successful novice station was in those days, and all the limitations that we had. So I, I instinctively am talking him or he or uh, it's always the male vernacular in these in these videos. I can tell you that the YLs, or the young ladies, were in ham radio at this time. But we're talking a much smaller percentage. So forgive me a little bit. So when we start to talk about early novice transmitters, uh, there were some circuits that were quite popular from the 40s and 50s that found their way into the early 60s. The old 6L62, this is a 6L6 metal, the, the uh, 6L6 uh, glass would look something like this. Um, they had advertised that you'd be able to uh, develop 40 or 50 watts of input power with a transmitter like that, which would give you, you know, 25, 35 watts out on one tube transmitter. They did tend to raise some heck with crystals, and there were some circuits that overcame some of that problem. So you did see some of those circuits in, uh, in some of the early novice projects. Um, the uh, small one-tube transmitters like the Amico AC1, which used the 6V6 tube, we're talking uh, fairly low power output. Uh, here's a representative transmitter. This is a Jones type transmitter. Uh, it's a push-pull oscillator. Those single tube oscillator type transmitters with uh, either a 6V6 or a 5763 or a 6CL6 or 12BY7, we're talking about 3 to 8 watts out. They're very, very limited in their power output. Um, not the kind of thing that you'd want to give a novice if you want him to be successful. So the next step up was to use a, a tube like a 6L6 or um, an 807 or 1625. These tubes were readily available uh, as surplus for as little as 50 or 75 cents each. And with a tube like that, you could do a, uh, a 40 to 75 watt input power transmitter fairly easily. And the handbook had several circuits using 1625s or 807s. Uh, another tube that uh, became popular in the uh, 19, late 50s through the, uh, the 60s and into the 70s was the sweep tubes. This is a 6DQ6 and this tube is probably capable of uh, oh, 20 to 40 watt input power uh, type uh, finals. And then finally we get to the one that uh, becomes the, uh, the overall winner of the era, and that is the 6146 family. The 6146, you find it in many transmitters that uh, are not only in the handbook, but commercial novice transmitters begin to come on the scene. Uh, we have some early ones like the Heathkit DX20, which actually uses the sweep tube, but then you get into the later models like this DX40 over here that uh, uh, uses 6146. Even this Amico TX86 uses a 6146 in the final. So you're going to find that's, uh, that's really the popular tube in the era that we're talking about. Now 
Now, to be fair, um, the Elmer wants the novice to be successful, so he will uh, upgrade to general as soon as possible. So he's not going to give him a transmitter that puts out 5, 10, 15 watts. He wants the novice to have a, a, a good chance to be successful. So um, it was typical to give the novice a ready-made station that uh, he would pass down. For instance, a Heathkit DX35 or DX40, like this box, mated with a Heathkit HR10 type receiver. This would be a typical novice station passed down, probably from the mid-60s through the mid-70s. With crystal control over most of this era, um, you wanted to have a transmitter that was easy on the crystals and didn't break them like some of those one-tube transmitters did. And uh, you wanted something that uh, would allow the novice to be uh, able to produce between 30 and 50 watts output power. Something between uh, 30 and 50 watts output power you're definitely going to make contacts on all bands that uh, they were allowed to use. My own experience being introduced to surplus at uh, the very start of my ham career, I uh, gained an affinity with uh, converting surplus and uh, the ARC-5 transmitter was a natural choice. The problem was the ARC-5 transmitter was not crystal controlled. It was VFO controlled. So the handbook had a circuit that allowed you to be able to make an adapter. The adapter would put an external crystal oscillator um, outside the box and it would be plumbed in through a cable to replace where the original 12A6 oscillator tube uh, was in the transmitter. So that allowed uh, the novice to be able to at least have a 40 or a 80 meter type uh, transmitter with fairly low cost. Using a command set as a novice receiver is a little tricky because the band tunes so fast. Those were more useful for code practice than actual use as a novice receiver. So we're looking at a receiver. This is the receiver that was dropped off to me. And uh, this was my first receiver that I practiced code with, the BC-652 tank receiver. So it, I'm going to take it up to the novice band. I'm going to go up here. Now one of the problems with a receiver like this is if you're looking at the, at the dial, you can see we're at 3.7. Novices were only allowed to go from 3.7 to 3.75. So from there to there. Bang. From here to there. Just about two turns of the knob and you're out of the novice band. So not a great idea <laughs> to have to use this thing on the air. But boy, I did. So, now that we're looking at this picture, this is my actual novice ham shack. I found this photograph. This was actually commemorating a power supply accident that I've mentioned in other videos. As you can see, there's been a bad explosion, and the power supply, which is located in front of that 1920s radio, has literally exploded the capacitor pieces and wax paper and hot tin foil have gone all over and that's pretty much wiped out the whole picnic table test bench. Uh, so, you know, that story was, you know, an experimental AC uh, supply that didn't quite work out. So I would say this is probably... Um, during my, my novice year, um, as you can see, there's the Sears Base Station CB, 
with the code key which was used um, to practice CW on the CB band which is a good way to make friends on the CB band is to send a lot of code and then next to it is the Heath tour this was given to me by a novice who had not actually gotten his license but his Elmer or his ham radio mentor had given him the Heath tour as well as that old tank receiver that's off to the right so I got two of those right off the bat I had the Sears base station um, the the 1920s radio was found in the trash the old thing uh, in back of the toolbox to the very left there that's actually a Grundig portable receiver got that from my uncle and got that to work somehow um, let's see what else we got here oh we have the realistic DX 150 the first model of the DX 150 that was an extravagant Christmas present and uh, nobody deserved to get such a present as that uh, as as a uh, fairly young kid uh, next to that was my first transmitter, the uh, the ARC-5, uh, the ARC-5 that I bought from Fair Radio Sales, and uh, I built the power supply that's just next to the Heathkit Tour out of uh, some TV parts. That was a successful power supply, unlike the one that's exploded in the foreground. And then way to the right is another Fair Radio purchase. That's an R508A aircraft receiver which I successfully converted uh, using a 73 magazine article and I converted it just as they described in the article and that actually picked up uh, not only aircraft but it picked up uh, satellites in the 140 uh, just below two meters and then above that is a shop project it's a super regenerative receiver this is a one tube super regen with a 6J5 and that was uh, covered the FM band and it worked really well so there you go FM with a super regen in my novice station so uh, pretty well equipped up top we've got a tube tester to the far left some reference books uh, what looks like a, uh, a generator of some kind and a speaker so that's the uh, that is my original novice station what's missing from it came a little bit later hadn't been built in this picture and that was a 6V6 transmitter uh, into a 6DQ6 that was uh, inspired by the handbook 35 watt 6DQ6 transmitter which didn't work very well and it cracked crystals so I added a 6V6 to it and made it a two tube transmitter that got me on 15 meters with the DX150 receiver and now I could do DX The novice was fairly limited in the test equipment that he had. Uh, I have a wave meter. This was given to me. And basically, the wave meter allows you to check for harmonics on different bands. The simple antenna that the novice was using, usually a dipole or a ground mounted vertical, um, it was very easy for the novice to accidentally tune up on a harmonic. And this wave meter box, the Lafayette wave meter, allowed the, the novice to look for those harmonics and make sure that he was tuned correctly. As far as matching the antenna, uh, typical matchets like this SWR meter, uh, again this is a Lafayette, um, was what you used to make sure that the antenna's SWR was low enough. Another problem with running surplus was you needed to construct a power supply. Usually a power supply about this size to run a ARC-5 station, for instance, or a transmitter that used a 6L6 or a single 6DQ6. It was a pretty big undertaking to home brew your own equipment. This is why Heathkit got into the game and made kits. The kit experience allowed the, the young ham and the Elmer to build the kit together. So these transmitters and receivers by Heathkit were really a, a powerful tool 
to get the young ham interested in ham radio as well as to have them start to do some soldering and some basic electronics. So in the next video we're actually going to try some of this gear. We'll do a complete novice setup including the transmitter, the receiver, the antenna changeover system, and the antenna and grounding system. Also I had some questions about why the turtleneck and uh, of course I'm, I'm trying to look in the period, uh, the period of the 60s and early 70s we wore turtlenecks. Uh, hams are not too cool. Um, they're nerds and they need anything that, at all to try to dress them up a little bit. I hope that you've enjoyed this introductory video into the uh, novice station of 1960 through the early 70s.